Here I was, blaming AEW for feeding you chicken shit, knowing you mindless millennials would be eating it up as if it were chicken salad, when it's really been your fault all along. Make chicken salad out of chicken shit. People is as people does, that's all there is to it. Put a square pig in a round hole, just never seems to fit. And you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Welcome to Make Chicken Salad, the Wrestle Radio Australia show where we talk about everything going on around the world of professional wrestling. I am Lachlan Albert and I am joined today by not one but two vastly more experienced hosts than me. First off, as always, is Mr. Todd Eastman. Todd, how you doing, mate? I'm not too bad, mate. I'll tell you what, you're, um, that was like Excalibur type speed for the start of that, <laughs> that uh, intro. I'm firing off. We got content to make, mate. So alongside Eastman is the Brainier behind WrestleBrainia. It is coming in from Melbourne, Jeff Setti. Jeff, how you doing, mate? I'm a very good man without a mask. How you, how's yourself? Uh, I'm doing fantastic, mate. I should I should grab a mask. I've got a signed Penta mask up there somewhere I can grab down. But look, uh, yeah. we'd, we'd better get right into it because I think it's basically the biggest wrestling news in years if not decades, Vince McMahon is retiring. Um, I didn't think we'd see the day. I thought he'd be dead. Uh, He tweeted out, quote, at 77, time for me to retire. Thank you, WWE Universe. Then, now, forever, together. Hashtag WWE, hashtag thankful. Uh, We got a report coming out with uh, Triple H coming back, uh, announced that He'll resume his his executive position as EVP Talent Relations. We've also got conversation about the new uh, co-CEOs being confirmed in the form of Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan. Obviously, this comes in the wake of the sexual misconduct allegations around Vince McMahon. Um, But this is a kind of a crazy moment to be living in because really, I don't think any of us have been aware of a time in wrestling where there wasn't Vince McMahon running the WWE, you know, he's, what was it, 82, he officially completed the purchase for Titans, so Mm. that's a full 40 years of him being in charge of this company. Um, I'll jump straight to you, Todd. What do you think this means for the world of wrestling? Um, Well, it's a a whole new world, I guess. I guess is a way of saying it, because the old guard is pretty much gone. I'm really interested to see how long that Bruce Pritchard, uh, done, stick around for now because, like, and if Vince still has a say in things, then they're, they're still going to be around. But if Vince really truly is done, retired, that's it. He's off into the the distance. Then the whole that whole landscape can change. That and then the TV fourteen, and it's very interesting times. Very interesting times. Yeah, worth noting that he is still remaining as majority shareholder. So when it comes to all of that corporate side of things, he still does have a large element of control. But obviously him not being at the head of creative means that, you know, anything could happen. In saying that, uh, sounds like the first time this new creative team had a choice when it sounded like Lesnar might not be there, uh, they jumped to get Bill Goldberg in. So uh, maybe it is... Business as usual. I 100% um, <laughs> think that was an absolute work. That was a, <laughs> let's find out who the mole is in this fucking company. We're going to tell certain people different people's names and see which one leaks. And as soon as we know which one leaks, we know who the mole is. Yeah, because they called me and wanted me to wrestle Reigns. And I said, no, you're not, <laughs> you're not offering enough, guys. I don't do the job. <laughs> Jeff, yeah. don't job. I don't job on the PPV. No yob. As <laughs> no yob. No, no yob. But um, like, well, also I, Vince I, did it in the, so, the such a Vince way, like three hours before SmackDown, I'm going to announce my retirement so everybody watches SmackDown to see what happens. Mm. But it's not it's only weird. that though, Todd. It's, it's he retired five minutes after the stock market closed on a Friday afternoon. That's smart. That's just smart right there. Go on, Jeff. <laughs> I was going to say, it's, it's very weird because while it is a Vince way to do it, it's also not a Vince way to do it. Because Vince is, you'll look at me as much as I want, damn it. 
And you don't think he'd, he'd want to retire, you know, at the end of a WrestleMania going, I'm, you know, with everyone applauding Vince going, thank you, Vince, thank you, Vince. What happened between the actual first allegation coming out, and, and this is, I mean, no one can answer this, but what happened between the first allegation coming out and the day Vince announced his retirement is, is a minefield. It is, it is, you remember how, how WrestleMania a few years ago, Shane had the lockbox of secrets. I reckon the lockbox of secrets is whatever the fuck happened between, between <laughs> the announcement the of the second allegation right through to when he retired. There's, there's just a whole heap of shit that's going to come out. Yeah, it was all the NBA's that are in that lockbox. <laughs> all right, yeah, look, <laughs> we can talk about a lockbox of NDAs all day, but it's definitely going to be a different world. There was someone holding up a sign at the Ring of Honor show this weekend, uh, declaring it uh, day one AV after Vince. So, <laughs> yeah, we're looking at a really different world here, but um, look, we, we can't spend all show on it when there's also I'd been... I'd Sorry, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, though, and this is something I can't remember which one brought it up. It was one of the, the bigger wrestling journalists that said, look, for a lot of guys that left WWE and joined up with AEW, now maybe think about going back because Vince isn't there anymore and it's Hunter running things, like in, in talent relations. So there could be a certain shift of all these guys that Hunter signed for NXT maybe coming back if they think that... that we're going to get treated a lot better if we go to the main roster now. I just want to say also that um, it, it, while there will be changes, certainly, definitely in the short term, I think ultimately this is prepping the WWE to be sold to a Universal or a Disney or a Fox. Man, it, I think it's not Ross, going to be. I honestly think that Dwayne Johnson is going to buy that thing. I don't. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me what makes me think that. I just. So you, you think you've got this visual image of Dwayne going through Vince's old rummage, going, "Yeah, I want this. I'll, I'll take the, I'll take the, take the XFL, XFL, and I'll take the WWE, but I don't want the WBF. You can fucking no. keep the WBF." Yeah, <laughs> but like, like seriously though, he he is somebody that that knows the wrestling business. Oh yeah, would be able to get enough capital to buy the thing, and with his production studio has enough connections that he could sell to, to Fox, to, to NBC, has relationships with all these, these people already. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, call me a, like, uh, call me wearing a tin hat. Not only that, the co-CEO is Nick Khan, who he's known since he was a kid. Yeah. 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 It's True. Very, but I, like, think, I think if The Rock buys it, you'll see Shane O'Mac walk back in. Because The Rock and Shane O'Mac. Are very close. I mean, I think Shane's going to come back now anyway. Mm. Well, there's also reports coming out that uh, Shane actually is currently in a bit of a rocky relationship with Stephanie McMahon, who is co-CEO at the moment. So there's a lot of factors going on here, and it's hard to tell exactly what's truth, exactly what's fabricated, you know, what's relevant to things people actually care about. Is Stephanie the kind of person who will say, I'm not getting along with Shane at the moment, let's not have him in? Is Stephanie the kind of person who says, Shane's a McMahon, let's bring him into the company even if I'm fighting with him? Are they even fighting? We really don't know. Who would you get? I, I think that that's a, a really relevant point. Um, but I, I have a question. I was thinking you know, this while you were chatting about the Stephanie-Shane dynamic. Who would you get to head up creative? If you, if you were Nick Khan, and Nick Khan is not a creative guy, who would you get to head it up? Like, I would try and bring back all those guys that were doing NXT originally and just move all the guys that they got rid of with those, those cuts that they did. Remember how they mm. went through and they cut all of, like, his right-hand men through yeah. NXT? I would be bringing those guys back, putting them in the big boy's share and go, do with that what you did to NXT. Please. That's fair. Like, what would you do, mate? Well, I was going to say Todd Eastman, um, but if he doesn't want to do it, that's fine. I can't move. Who? I can't. I can't Who? move. <laughs> Who? Todd the, Eastman. The, the, yeah. the dogs. The dogs can't handle international travel. <laughs> Otherwise, that's, actually, that's the barrier to that job. That's the barrier. The dogs. I was thinking the most, probably the most successful in-ring period outside of NXT is probably the SmackDown Six. 
And so I'd, I'd be talking to Heyman. I'd be really, I'd be really conversing with Heyman right now. And I think that Heyman is in a great role in the middle of, you know, what he's doing performing. And it, so he's already there. It's not like he's off working with another company or something. You've got him right there. And Heyman has never run a promotion that didn't have eyes on it. No. Um, you know, True. if you're not putting him in charge of the financials, I think it's hard to argue with having him, you know, in a prominent creative role. Yeah. Either, either the top creative guy or one of. Mm. But also, I don't, I don't, I, if I recall, didn't him and Stephanie sort of butt heads a lot in that time? Yeah. yeah. So. At, at the same, at the same time, you know, when Stephanie ran back there and it was one of the the worst products commercially and creatively that we saw from the WWE. Yeah, I don't think so, I don't think creatively she's all that good. Like if if it wasn't the fact that he was already doing talent relations, I'd put Hunter in that spot. Absolutely. Because he I mean I think I think we're gonna see Road Dog go back to the Fed probably within about three weeks. He'll be back yeah, there. Yeah. Um Scotty Too Hotty will be back there. Like all the guys that were trainers at NXT are probably going to move up. And you're right, they're probably going to become match producers because mm. they were doing work really, really well. Yeah, I, yeah, for it's... me, I want to know who's taking Kevin Dunn's job. That's the one on my... Because I can't see a world in which Kevin Dunn sticks around. A carrot. Um, a carrot is <laughs> currently slated to do Kevin Dunn's job. And guess what? He'll fucking do it better with less irritating zooms every 30 seconds. That, that being said, though, it is not... It's not an easy job at all what, what he does, oh. like, week in and week out. Like, you look at, like, Bruce Mitchell, who's just retired from AEW. Even some of his stuff near the end, he was missing a lot of stuff, like oh, yeah. shots and, and, and whatnot. Like, if anything, I, the first thing I would do is just send an edict down going, stop doing the zoom in, in and out. Stop that shit. If they stop that shit, the, the, the product would be infinitely better. I, I just think they need to reduce the amount of camera work entirely and just have more focus on the action. Cut less often. Show us... If you want to stick to hard cam for a while, stick to hard cam for a while. I, I guess I say that as someone who watches a lot of indies where I'm only watching the hard cam, so I'm used to it, whereas maybe a more mainstream audience is not. But if the focus is on the in-ring product, you don't really need that many camera cuts. And with the no. quality of wrestling that's in those rings now you don't have to cut every time they make impact to stop it from looking like it's a mile off having any but, no but that's that's a complaint of all of all um mainstream wrestling i think is is stop the camera cuts let's just slow down what made it successful in the first place like the, the characters and the storylines let's just and the managers to be honest mm -hmm. i miss managers in wrestling hey, let's man, go back buddy. to that <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I, there are I miss, no good <laughs> I miss I miss managers. I don't know any good managers. Is the thing. It's all right. I don't know any good commentators anymore. <laughs> we can play that game, dickhead, all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know any good wrestling comedy trivia panel host. <laughs> <laughs> Just felt like I had uh, to get that in, guys. Yeah, you get that <laughs> yourself in there, Jeff. Too. That that being said, though, before we move on, like you can say a lot of bad stuff about Vince over the years. And I will. But, but the fact yeah. of the matter is, if it wasn't for him and opening up the whole WWF back in the day and, and making it as mainstream as what he was, a lot of us wouldn't be watching wrestling. A lot of us wouldn't have, like, discovered the thing that we absolutely love. We wouldn't have discovered indie wrestling. We wouldn't have discovered any of this. And a lot of that is 100% because we turned on our TV on a Sunday morning and we saw superstars. Yeah. Or we, you know what I mean? A lot, a lot of that is yeah. that, like, we saw the Heart Foundation, we saw the British Bulldogs. If you're my age, uh, yeah. for, for you, Lachlan, it'd be like the Undertaker, the Hardy. I saw a picture of the Undertaker in a kids' magazine, and that was it. That was wrestling yeah. for me. See, um, none know. of that stuff would have happened if Vince had been like, if Vince wasn't there. Okay. If Vince had just stayed as a New York, like Philadelphia promotion, if the, the Indies but had stayed the way they were. The region. With, it, with, yeah. all, with all due respect, and, and I agree with you, I'm not. But if, and, and this, is, this is a matter for another podcast, and I'm sure we'll discuss it down the road, if Vince hadn't have popped, Bill Watts was ready to. So if Vince didn't, didn't go, 
Watts was ready too. Mm. So but I uh, just I I think that that Watts wouldn't have had the vision to be able to take it as big as what Vince did. Oh, certainly, certainly. Like just um, because of how strict he was with, like you, you, like we can say how good Watts is, but remember this is the guy that said no moves off a second rope. Don't go over the top rope. Don't, don't go over the top rope. Let's take yeah. away all the mats from the outside. So, but saying all of that, I agree with you. I just wish Vince wasn't such a reprehensible person. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Look, it's Im- I think it's impossible to argue that Vince is not the most influential figure in the history of professional wrestling. Like, nobody has changed the world of professional wrestling to the level Vince has. And you can argue whether that's for better or for worse, but it's impossible to know because the world of professional wrestling that exists today exists due to Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that there is no way that WWE, as it is now, cannot change in some, some major ways. But I think overall, the industry is better for having had Vince be a part of it as a wrestling promoter. Mm-hmm. That, like, forget everything else. As a wrestling promoter, that's exactly it, right. It, it's in better shape than it would have been. And we know about it, as you said, Todd. We know about yeah, it. Yeah, we know about it. Move on, sir. Move on, Locke. This has been great. But- All righty. <laughs> All righty. Let's, let's talk about a great show that we had on the weekend, One Day AV. Uh, it was Ring of Honor's Death Before Dishonor. So Ring of Honor had one return show after being bought by Tony Khan. This is... For me, I think the first time that Ring of Honor have been back putting on a wrestling show under Tony Khan without it being the thing that Tony Khan just bought, right? This is, Mm -hmm. let's have a Ring of Honor show now that we're back. So a few matches in the pre-show. First off, we've got Colt Cabana going over Anthony Henry. There was a tag match where the Trust Busters of Ari Davari and Slim J beat the Shinobi Shadow Squad, which was Cheeseburger and Eli Osom. And we had Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony in a six-man, beating Tony Depp and Alex Zane and Break Christian. And Willow Nightingale in a women's match, beating Alison Kay. Now, did any of these matches, before we get on to the main show, did any of the pre-matches jump out at you Anything important we need to mention there? Well, there was the promo during the Zero Hour where Prince Nana came in and announced that he had bought Tully Blanchard Enterprises off Tully. So now it's the embassy. So it's like Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony and, well, probably not anymore, but Jonathan Gresham are the embassy. So which is a, a good throwback to the old Ring of Honor. Yeah, I think having Prince Nana there was interesting. I don't know if it was a positive contribution to the show. It was definitely a throwback, but I don't know if the presence of Prince Nana made the show any better for me. And, like, we'll talk about the World Championship match in just a second, but he was there managing Gresham and had, for my money, zero impact on the match. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. He came out, he thumped the mat, he did one or two facial expressions and then he kind of disappeared by the end. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You you and I off air, Jeff, were talking about this and I was like, if they knew they were going to do this with Jonathan Gresham, if they knew that this was going to happen, why would you bother having Nana out there with him? You would have just let Jonathan Gresham go out on his own and yeah. have Nana do the whole thing with Gates and Agony and Brian Cage, set themselves off with a win and look like strong. Instead, yep. he sort of looks ineffectual because his first big match as a manager with the world champion, the dude lost the belt. I probably would have uh, shot a quick ang- angle and aired it during zero hour of Nana and, and Gresham not getting on. You then have the ending. Um, Claudio goes over, which was great and um, happened. And then Gresham gets revenge attack on Nana. Nana causes Claudio to win, you know, there's some kind of trip malfunction. And then the Gates of Agony come out and beat the shit out of Gresham and he goes. Mm. That's what I would have done. Yeah. An extra 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. There you go, Jeff. There's a spot in WWE creative for you there, mate. <laughs> um, look, let's 
let's jump also, in. I will, I will about- say, because this is one that, that Jeff and I, again, we disagree on. I cannot stand Willow Nightingale. I think, I think she's as green as Kermit the Frog. It's like Alison Cade, like she proves that she must have a, have a hell of a lot of, she must be able to squat a lot because she carried this girl through a match. See, I like Willow. Look, I think Willow's a good character, and I think she's she's got a I lot think of. She's, I think she's great until the bell rings. <laughs> I think she's got a lot of upside, and I like that they're putting her in a good position and they're, and they're giving her a bit of a push. I'm, I tell you what, I'm glad to not be the only voice of reason here with Todd on the podcast. Um, I think that, look, I fully agree with you, Todd. She is, right now, she's not setting the world on fire in the ring, right? But she has so much potential character-wise, and like you said, she is so green, which means that the amount of opportunity she has to improve is, she's got years. She's yeah, got years. which like, I completely agree. That's why I wouldn't be putting her on this stage just yet. Like, right. have so like instead of, for a instead while. Instead of worked... putting her on, what you're saying is instead of putting her on, like, a pay-per-view like Death Before Dishonor, you'd put her on, like, the pre-show, like the zero-hour type thing? That was still watched by, what, 75,000 people? No, I would put her on Dark. I'd put her on Elevation for a while. Have her work indies. Have her do all that stuff. Have her round her skills off before she comes on. And because it only takes one big botch on one of these shows, for people to remember that forever. Yeah, but by the same token, it only takes one match to turn people's opinions around. And it might be a little while before it happens, but it can happen, though. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm not going to spend too long arguing this one because Wheeler Yuta's on the card. No one to argue with Todd about how good he is later. So yeah, we let's were. move on. Um, <laughs> look, let's tie in the first match with the big news. So opening match of the contest, we're told on commentary there was a coin flip between the double main event to work out who would go on first and who would close the show, which meant that the Ring of Honor World Championship match was the match to jerk the curtain on this one. Claudio Castagnoli defeating Ring of Honor World Champion Jonathan Gresham to become the new champion um, in about 15 minutes. Uh, Then we start getting some news as to what's going on here. We've got Fightful Select reporting Gresham asked for his release earlier in the day before the pay-per-view. Uh, the outlet was told there was, quote, a lack of communication between Ring of, Ring of Honor and the former world champion leading up to the show, which led to him feeling disrespected. And the short run time for the world title match was reportedly a tipping point on that as well. Uh, Fightful indicated that Gresham had a meeting with Tony Khan prior to the show, which included him, quote, cussing out Khan, uh, with several talent confirming the encounter. However, it's not been confirmed whether Gresham's request for a release had been granted. Uh, he reportedly left right after his match. Gresham is, quote, done with wrestling for the foreseeable future after this month, according to Fightful, uh, after reaching out to the former champ and Khan for responses. Reportedly, Gresham came out for his match without his usual gear. Uh, because he, quote, wanted to be himself and see everything clearly for what would possibly be his last match. Fightful hadn't received a response from Tony Khan or Ring of Honor. Uh, It's worth noting Gresham's Twitter account has been deactivated. Um, We were talking briefly before the show about seeing what Gresham looked like coming out for this match. He didn't have the mask, he didn't have the jacket, he didn't have the flag, like we mentioned there. But he also looked like he was not, Super excited to be in this match. Let's put it that way. It He wasn't giving it the energy you might expect for a world championship match. In saying that, when you put Claudio Castagnoli and Jonathan Gresham in a ring, you're not going to get one and a half stars. It was no. a good match. No. But, but like was- to, you, to your point to the length of the match, <clears throat> Brian Cade's in the gates of the agony match was longer on the zero hour. So that's... Not by much. It was like ten seconds or something, but still, that's a that's an ROH World Title match, and they were smart. They were smart, I must admit, because they learned their lesson from the last show where they had Gresham and Bandito follow close the show, FTR and Briscoes, and just couldn't do it because no. of how good that 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 was. So they learned, like Tony learned his lesson from that guy. Let's keep that as far apart as possible. <laughs> so. Both, both will get their shine. And it was it was a really good match. 
I think I think that um, what those two did in 15 minutes, most people can't do in an hour. So they mm. packed oh, yeah. a well, great was, match was, in that 15 minutes. If I, if I can remember off the top of my head, because I was listening to a review of the show today, it was 10 minutes 35 was that match. Wow. Yep. I've got written down here uh, 11 minutes 30. Uh, by 11. my notes, so it's it's around that time, not very long. There was only that, one match on the main show that was shorter, and it was the six man tag match that came directly after. That is that is um, Eddie Kingston Punk levels of packing great stuff mm. into a short match. That really is. That was I um <clears throat> I don't hide the fact that I'm a huge fan of Claudio. So for me, I, personally, it was just beautiful to see him finally be able to call himself a world champion. Sure, yeah. it's not the AEW belt, it's not the WWE belt, but I think that myself and a lot of people were clamouring for him to get a good run in the WWE and he didn't. Now, where this leaves him with Ring of Honor not really having a television contract at the moment is a little bit frustrating, but I don't think... I think that he'll be used well enough to kind of keep that belt active. Well, I think I think you and I were talking. When you and I, it was I think you and I, you Welsh and I, where I was like, I don't know why they don't just make AEW Dynamite, Ring of Honor, Rampage. Rampage. I agree with you. Yeah, I think it was you and I. Yeah, I think it was you and I, and, and that, I agree completely. Two separate bits of talent. Like, there's always the crossovers, of course, because they seem to have just blended these rosters in. But it would give give them time to be able to do this sort of stuff. I know it's really hard because, like, Tony's bought a million people. <laughs> but it's like it would give it would give time for guys like Claudio and then FTR to have a match. Like they wouldn't have to be both on the same show every month. They could they could rotate the title for like. One week it's Claudia defending. The next week it's Samoa Joe defending. The week after that it's it's FTR defending, and mm. then you keep everything fresh. I'm gonna look, I'm gonna respectfully disagree, Todd, because they don't have time to put on all their talent on TV from the AEW side of things as it is, right? No, There's, no, we, and we talk about it every week. No one's getting television time because there's a dozen wrestlers who are on TV and there's 40 who are on dark every week. And if you're half the number of AEW shows, yes, admittedly, you get some of these Ring of Honor people on. Um, but you, adding that much more talent across those two shows, we're already only getting two women's matches a week across the two but, shows. Let's add in a whole other women's roster. Is it really adding that much more talent? Because you think of the crossover between the two, there's not exactly... That many guys that are ROH like dedicated wrestlers, and let's, I, I can't and let's think, be honest, unless it's the Briscoes who like TBS and TNT don't want on their network anyway. There's I, so I you're going to put on a, a Ring of Honor show without the Briscoes showing up? Well, that's what the that's what the what's his name's for. They, you could obviously always also have a YouTube show as well to to, to work that through. But and and let's let's be honest, lot. It's not like Rampage is must-watch TV anymore. Like in some weeks right. it's great, but other weeks it's like, well, this is completely missable. Like this weekend with a rap battle in the middle, why don't they just make it ring up on a Rampage and make it must-watch TV again? Because I think that'll please the network. Like, yes, you can't have FTR on there, but that'll please the network. That'll please a lot of people. And give FTR a manager. Give them Prince Nana and Prince Nana can speak for them no, and say, he's... His boys are down in the chicken farm. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> Look, I don't really disagree. I just think it's fun to argue with you mostly, Todd. Um, <laughs> and look, if, if you guys out there listening want to argue with us, there's plenty of places you can do it. So get in touch on all our socials, at Wrestle Radio AU on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, search for Wrestle Radio Australia on Facebook and get in touch with us there and tell us what you think of the shows. Uh, but we, we want to tell you more of what we think of this Ring of Honor show, and so we'll do it right after this break. Road A pod. You know who else is that guy? Oh. You know what that guy does? That guy sits in the middle and uses both armrests. Oh, full bro. spread. Full spread. That's that guy. Okay. That's that guy. Right. If you take a plane, right? If you're in a plane, don't take a plane. If you're in a plane, yeah, don't take a plane. Bro, and you're in close. the middle and you use both, you are scum. 
You are scum. You don't get those armrests. Wait. Come on. Come on, I'm <laughs> well with you. Wait, what? No, the middle guy definitely gets those armrests. Both of them? Yes. Full spread? Yes. I don't know, man. No, okay, sorry. No, because I saw a meme about this. I retract everything I just said. I'm flopping right now. <clears throat> Follow Bro Day No Plan B podcast on Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Making Chicken Salad, where we are, we are reviewing Ring of Honor's Death Before Dishonor 2022. We're one match in. We're on a speed <laughs> record here. So let's talk about the six-man tag championship match, which happened between Dalton Castle and the boys versus the Righteous, with Castle and his boys becoming the new six-man champs. I'll pass this one over to Jeff first. Jeff, what did you reckon of this match? I really liked it. I mean, it was to achieve the purpose of getting Dalton Castle out there, which is fantastic because he deserves that high level of exposure. Very good character. He's looking a bit bigger, but he, he bust his back a few months ago. So kind of makes sense that he looked a bit bigger. Um, and I think that I think that um, Vincent and and the Righteous will sort of disappear now and, and the boys and, uh, and Dalton will anchor that. That six man belt, and it's it's just great to see Dalton Castle, you know, because I like him as smooth sailing Ashley Remington in Shikara. So I think I think that it, it's it's a good move to give him some focus on a national scale. I I like the fact that they brought back the original boys. Yep, the take because for a, for a while there they were just using two randoms with Dalton, and it just wasn't work, it wasn't working. It wasn't for me anyway. It wasn't clicking. But with those two, the, there just seems to be a chemistry between the three of them that works. And, yeah, I enjoyed the match for what it was. Yeah, I, look, I thought it was a really fun match. For me, when it comes to trios like this, I always feel I, I feel like it's doing a disservice to the other team when one person in one of the trios is clearly the good one that has the other two with him. And it, it always gets pitched like that when it's Dalton and the boys. Don't get me wrong. I think the Tate twins are really good. I think that they're good workers and they showed up well in this match. But the way the story of the match worked out, it's Dalton and the boys are also there. So what does that say about the Righteous, that they were beaten by Dalton, who uses these two other guys as weapons? That's my only problem with it. I think while you've got a, a solid point, I think that the pure mechanic was to move the belts to Dalton and the boys, and it did so in a, in a relatively entertaining and fun match. Like, there were some really fun spots in there. They used the valet for the Righteous really well. I hope she sticks around, even if the Righteous don't. And I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of, of, of good things in that match that can be built on if they choose to build on it or move Dalton and the boys to someone else. Mm. Yeah, fully agree about Vita Von Star as well. I think she's she's really fantastic. She was. Uh, after that is we had a pure match. Now I uh, I really enjoyed this one. It was a pure championship match between Wheelie Yuta and Daniel Garcia. Oh, uh, prior to the match, you right there, Todd? Wake you, wake you. Yeah, up. These, you said uh, Wheelie Yuta, and I fell asleep. Um. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, look, before the match, Daniel Garcia talked about taking the belt back so the Jericho Appreciation Society could destroy it. Um, and there was a bit of a storyline of, yeah, sorry, I said Jericho Appreciation Society and you were asleep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but look, I'm, I'm a sucker for a pure match. I love when you've got those extra stipulations in. And I love that the story of this match was about neither of them wanting to use any of the rope breaks. Now, there's plenty of matches that don't have a rope break in them, but when you've got a number of rope breaks on the screen and so it becomes part of the story that they're not using them, I find that really interesting. And I thought that, you know, this is a really good match. I, I like seeing both of these guys in the ring. I think Yuta is a great worker and I love seeing his matches. Um, go ahead and tell me I'm wrong, boys. No, I'm not going to. Sorry, Todd, I'm not going to for a second. But I will say that Daniel Garcia needs to get the fuck away from the Jericho Appreciation Society as soon as Monday. It's just not working. I, I think Jericho needs to go off television. I really do. And I never thought I'd say that. But between recent developments regarding January 6th and um, his whole 
uh, dragging feuds out for way longer than necessary, winning the majority of matches and finally putting the person over in the final match, see Cassidy, comma, Orange, it's just not working. It just doesn't work as a long-term storytelling device. So I think it worked, but I think we just need to see Garcia, like, boot it out and, and get angry because I think the story about him being in the car accident, he's a great heel, but the story about him being in the car accident, all that stuff works for a face. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I did like is I don't know if you saw the promo package but in before where they were doing the, the talking, like, to each other. Yeah. And Garcia was Garcia brought up the point that, and Brian Danielson said he wanted to put a group together. He named all these people. He named me. He never named you. So what does that say about you? Yeah, that's great. I love, like, Daniel Garcia came from, from someone from me that when he first started in AEW, I'd heard all the raps about him from the indies, but when he first started in AEW, I was just like, Tony Khan is just jamming this guy down our throat and having him lose all the time, and I'm not interested in him at all. Because of that. Now, like, he's being used a little less, but they're letting him talk. They're letting him work in the ring against guys that are really good. So they're, 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 they're showcasing what he can do. He's becoming, like, one of my more, one of, the, one of the people that's on a show that I'm more interested in watching than a lot of people that I used to really like. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I, that's fair. I love Daniel Garcia's work. I love his Twitter. If you've seen his Twitter, he tweets about like mechanically why he's doing certain things in a match, right? Like that's so good to be constantly talking about how good you are because I do this little thing in a match for this exact reason. And that's the stuff that makes wrestling feel real, right? Yeah. One, one thing I that's did why like, we're buying in. one thing I did like too is during the match, the, during the commentary, they asked William Regal why Daniel Garcia isn't in the Blackpool Combat Club. And he was like, well, if we have all the good people, who will we fight? Yeah. My, and I, my I other, love that. My other note for that is when Garcia put the regal stretch on and a beautiful regal stretch, nailed it, perfect. And um, uh, Rick Abani said to, to regal, um, did you teach... Did you teach Wheeler an escape for this? And there's this long pause and Regal just goes, of course. And it was perfect. (laughs) It was no perfect. Yeah, uh, we should mention that um, Regal was on commentary twice through the night. He was on uh, in the opening Claudio title match and during this match. And both times he was absolutely superb. Just the more Regal we can get, the better. He's never not, to be honest. Do you, know, do you know what um, it is that I worked out too? What annoys me a little bit about Wheeler Utah? Go on. Is he always walks around like he's wearing a t shirt that still has the coat hanger in it? It's like, <laughs> all right. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Can't, I, can't, I, just, I don't like do you, him. I know you don't like him, and I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about him that I do love so much. I just do you know what? Do you know what? He's a good wrestler when the bell rings. He's Up the until opposite then, of Willow he's the shit. He's, Yes, he is. <laughs> he's the anti Willow. He's the anti Willow. It was like, but it's like in the promo, like they're like, he sounded like a fucking robot. What does that say about you? Remember that car accident you were in? I'm like, d- like, what's wrong with this robot? Fucking. Like, I thought they programmed to have a little bit of emotion now. I, I thought he was great leading up to the point, and I agree with you, I thought he was great leading up to the point he got into the Black Bull Combat Cup because he was he was showing passion and he was really, really into those promos. And of course, he was bouncing off uh, Danielson and Moxley, and, you know, that's easy. But yeah. then since he's got in, I've noticed they've largely gotten Regal to be his mouthpiece, which is a good move. Yeah, 100%. Because like I but said, yeah, I'm like... For me, he's like the wrestling's version of beige. It's like it's just there. Like I don't, I don't hate him. I don't like this. I don't feel any way towards him. He's just there. When he wrestles, he's good. But I don't think about him five minutes after the match is over. Whereas Daniel Garcia, I'm still like that dude's fucking great. Yeah, but sometimes Todd, I don't want to be thinking about someone five minutes after a match is over. Sometimes I want to put on a match, watch a good match, and then shut it off. You know what I mean? Like, I get what you're saying. But at the same time, 
I like watching good wrestling. Yeah. Right. If you want to but talk then, about how good someone's promo is, like but then let's if you go forgot back and, five and Jeff, like be be kind to me here because I'm gonna rag on your boy a little bit. <laughs> Castagnoli is not the best promo in the world. Oh no, far from it. But Claudio, if if you turn around and you give Claudio, you get tell Claudio to get to a point. He'll get to that point and it'll be good. His promo, uh, I think it was on Rampage where he came out and said, I'm going to win that belt, was great. It was yeah. a good, succinct, great promo from a guy who can talk. Like the misnomer is he can't talk. Yeah. He can. But but this and, is my point, right? You don't have to be a great promo to be someone who is absolutely awesome to watch. No, you don't. But you think- show some personality in the ring as well. And Wheeler doesn't do that. Like in my opinion, Wheeler doesn't do that. At the risk, when I say, at the risk when of, I say thinking about someone five minutes after a match, I don't think about them. If I'm not thinking about them five minutes after a match, why would I want to come back and see them again? Why am I paying to see them again if I forgot all about them? Yeah, I like watching good matches. So. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that just makes me different. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> at the risk of not being popular and, and just to... I don't think Samoa Joe is a great promo either. But... You're wrong, but go on. <laughs> no, he's, he's not a great promo. He's fine, but he's serviceable. But Wendy! <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you set me up for it. I couldn't help it. All right, look, let's move on to the only non-title match that was on this card, and that was a brother versus brother match with Roosh defeating Dragon Lee in, look, I, I think that this match is going to get passed over because there wasn't a lot of huge storyline developments, but I thought it was an absolute cracker of a match. In <laughs> fairness, these are the kind of guys I love. I'm that Mexican style, you know, infused with that hard-hitting Japanese thing because that's the trajectory of both of these guys, you know, doing the Los Ignobles thing through Mexico. It's my exact style, so I know I'm biased, but, man, Roosh and Dragon Lee are guys that I love watching. They hit hard. They hit quick. They tell a story subtly while focusing on the wrestling. And I thought this was an absolute banger. I completely loved it. Um, I, you know, as much as it pains me to agree with you this quickly, Lachlan, I'm supposed to be the voice of dissent. I thought it was. I thought it was pretty wonderful. I like Roosh. I'm a fan of Roosh unashamedly. Um, I think he works so well as a smarmy arrogant heel uh, that doesn't need to say a lot and still gets who he is across like that. Terrific. I I like the way that they ramped up the, like it was two brothers. They, they, they shook hands and they hugged at the start of the match. But then as the match goes on, Roosh got progressively more of a, a bit of an arsehole towards his little brother. Mm. Bit, bit more of a, I'm the big brother. I'm the one in charge. You should know this type deal. To the point where at the end of the match, he was full-blown heel going after his brother. And that was the finish, right? Is Roosh acts like he's taken a really nasty hit from Dragon Lee. And Dragon Lee, being his little brother, goes over to check on him as the ref does. And Roosh takes advantage, nails him with another bull's horns because Dragon Lee kicked out of one of them. Um, Hits him with the second at absolute full force. Um... So it, it sets him. The reason he won is because he's an asshole, even to his brother. Yeah, it's great. And I, the only, the only spot that made me kind of a bit nervous was that table spot. I was just a bit worried about Dragon Lake. Oh. His, feet, his feet clipped the ropes on the way through. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. That's so why if, he didn't if you make haven't it. watched this, any viewers or listeners who haven't watched this match, Dragon Lee hit a suicida through the ropes to the announce table. Um, and it was he probably gnarly. would have made it really easily, but his feet clipped that second rope on the way through, which pretty yeah. much just like just stops you dead. And he <laughs> just barely made it to his brother. Yeah, but a, a beautiful match, just beautiful, yes. really, really good. Yeah, absolutely excellent. Um, and then after that, we went into a women's championship match, which had Mercedes Martinez defend her title against Serena Deeb. Now, you know. Quickly, I've been talking about these two women being the opportunity for tent poles of the AEW women's division for months. And they proved that they could do it here. It's that simple. 
yes, they proved that they could do it. I just wish the audience were, were a bit more engaged in it because they were clearly not engaged. By the end, though, they had won them over, and that is the mark of two pure professionals. Serena Deeb, in my mind, is one and always has been. I've always been a fan of Serena, one of the best wrestlers on the planet. Women or men, she is one of the best and most believable wrestlers on the planet. Mm. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a massive fan of, of hers. So it was a it was a great match. Like I, there were people saying that 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 is probably the best women's match in AEW Ring of Honor history. That that's but going I wanna, past. I want to jump on exactly what Jeff said there. That it felt like the crowd weren't into it at the start. I feel like this is an AEW crowd, right? This is the kind of crowd you get for AEW. It's not an old school Ring of Honor crowd, and the AEW crowd have been conditioned to the fact that if you're watching Rampage or if you're watching Dynamite, the women's match is the one that goes on at the same time every week so you can go piss before the men's main event. Mm. Yep. Consistently. And so yep. we've taught them, don't worry about the women's match. There'll be a good one every couple of pay-per-views, but really you don't have to stress about it. And it'll be a good one because Britt Baker's there. Other than that, you don't have to worry about the women. Yep. Yeah. That's, yep. Yeah. And something, something has to change there. They need to, like, Serena was great. And, and excellent character development when she was doing those five-minute challenges. But then for some reason, it went. For some reason, it just stopped. And I was like, no, you've got to continue with that so the crowd get more and more invested in those five-minute challenges. And she gets more and more psychotic about those five-minute challenges. But they just dropped it. And, and that I almost find bewildering about AEW's booking, particularly of the women, is that they, they don't seem to care to want to invest in them so the audience don't invest in them. But here's the other thing that I think this match shows exactly, and those five-minute challenges are exactly it. It shows how much the women have been focused on getting a lot of story out of a little time. A five-minute challenge is a brilliant idea because it means in under 10 minutes of time, you're getting across, I am a great wrestler. I am going to get out by the skin of my teeth, and that's why I'm going to survive. I'm going to act like I'm really confident and take on anyone, and I'm a great wrestler. Like, and you do that in under 10 minutes, including entrances, mm. right? Mm. The storyline going into this match was, oh, I was tag teaming with you so that in those matches where they shoved four women onto TV for under 10 minutes, that was actually me taking the time to study you so that when eventually I turned on you, I had the advantage. They're taking these really small bits of TV time and turning them into really good bits of booking, which is really surprising to me. Um, and... Well, I, I mean, think... I was going to say it's because Malenko is in charge of the women's division and Malenko knows what to do with a little bit of TV time because it's all he was ever <laughs> given in WCW. Yeah. So the guy knows how to make, make shine from very little. A thousand and one two-minute spots. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, look, and we talked a lot about Serena Deeb there, but, you know, Mercedes Martinez is also oh. one of the best women's wrestlers we've ever seen. You know, outside of WWE, there's very few women who have made as much of an impact as Mercedes Martinez. Um, and, yeah, I, this match was awesome. Phenomenal. Any Anything else to add, Todd? No, I, I agree completely. If I was going to argue something, I would. Perfect. <laughs> no, it was, we know it was you a great were. match. It was a great match. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the Ring of Honor Television Championship match between Samoa Joe and Jay Lethal. This is a match that started with before the bell rang the two men absolutely going to war uh, having some interference against Samoa Joe to kind of put him on the back foot um, but Samoa Joe eventually coming out victorious it's always weird when the storyline is that Jay Lethal is the inexperienced student out of the two men in the ring like for that to be the story building here just feels so out of place these days but um yeah, I mean, it was a good match. It just felt very almost WWE to me. You know what I mean? I've seen a lot of these guys. But it was it was also a very much a history of Ring of Honor type match. That is the history of Ring of Honor. That's where Jay was his young boy. He came like Samoa looked after him through the whole the whole thing. Samoa supported him through going for like the title and all of that, that sort of joint. And so for those two to go their separate ways the way they did 
And then Jay have all that success that he had in Ring of Honor. And for Samoa Joe to have his success in NXT and then WWE and then to come back and have Joe have like, like Jay saying, no, no, look, while you were gone, this place was mine. Don't just think you can walk in here now and say, well, I'm back now. Go and take your seat back behind me, young boy, because that's not what's going to happen. I'm Jay fucking lethal. That's the way it felt to me, like watching this match, watching the, this, the way they developed this feud. The Sanjay Dutt and the, the, the Satnam Singh thing, I could do without. But those two, those two were good. I think, and I think Samoa Joe looked slower. Like, still great, still an amazing in ring performer, but he looks slower than I remember. He looks slower than than I, I've seen him a couple of times, and he's usually amazingly quick. But he just looked a bit slower. I don't know whether it's the injury he's still carrying, or or what's going on there. He doesn't work as often either. He doesn't work often. Uh, saying that, Jay Lethal was great. Samoa Joe, aside from the speed issue, was fantastic, and it was a beautiful little match. Mm. I liked it. I always liked yeah, it that whole... It just feels like... Go on. It just feels like something I've seen before. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I saw it all the way through Ring of Honor and then all the way through TNA. I, I feel like it's a match that's been on for 15 years, which it has. You know what I mean? Did, did they work each other in TNA? Yeah. They had a bunch of X Division stuff when Joe yeah, was the X Division champion. Okay. I don't recall any of that, but okay. It's probably because they didn't bring up the whole, the history, the way this was brought up, the way that they've worked, they worked that in, which I loved. I love because of storytelling and I love that shit. Like, give me that, like, guy that, that is angry because he came back and, and wants to take over something that he's worked really hard to say that I was the best wrestler in Ring of Honor for, for years. I held the television and the world title at the same time. And you think you can just come back in now and do this? No. <laughs> yeah, and look, I, I guess where I'm at is it's always good to see Samoa Joe working back where he should be. You know what I mean? Um, his WWE run was good, and it showed that he really was someone who deserved to be in that limelight. Yeah. But, but he's also he, very this- injury-plagued in that time, unfortunately. This did feel they, more like the old joke. They also didn't use him after a point to the best of his abilities either. No. I think because they got to a certain point where, like, this guy's getting injured all the time. Should we keep investing in storylines for this guy when we don't know he's going to be around in a month yep. because of what? But this is what I said with back. This is back years ago when Brian was having all those issues with concussion. And that when he won the IC title and then had to drop it straight away because he had to take time off. And then he'd come back again. And I, I remember saying, I think it was to Josh, I, I can't remember if I was still doing the show with Josh then. I remember saying to him then, if I was a WWE, I would not be putting Brian Daniels or Daniel Bryan in a, in a main event storyline for a while until he can prove that he's not going to be injured every because you think about how much money they invest in promotion, how much money they, and if somebody just goes down injured, that's all that's gone. And you've got to double back and go, all right, let's do this now instead. Yeah. But, uh, you know, on the bright side, he didn't lose his smile. So, you know, no. we've got, the, <laughs> we've got the good and the bad. And I mean, what, what Brian Danielson is doing now in general is fantastic. His AEW stuff. But, oh, yeah. has been- but see also to the point of that, he was like, oh, WWE were, were holding me back from doing what I really wanted to do. and blah, blah. Obviously, they were doing that for a reason because when he started doing all this stuff in AEW, he got injured, out for an unspecified amount of time. Do, do you know what I mean? Week, <laughs> yeah, he's back this week. <laughs> but who knows how long for? Against Daniel Garcia. So you'll watch that. <laughs> yeah, of course I will. <laughs> but, yeah, well, uh, look. Obviously, we're going to be watching that. So if you want to hear what we think of it in the audience, there's one way to make sure you can. It's to subscribe to Wrestle Radio Australia. It's free. 
make sure you do it on you know youtube apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher wherever you get your podcasts hit that subscribe button uh and if you're on apple Podcasts as well give us a review five stars really helps us get into new ears speaking of five stars minimum there's one match left on the card and uh, i feel like we're going to talk about it for a little bit so we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back right here on making chicken salad Welcome back to Making Chicken Salad. We've got one more match from Death Before Dishonor to talk about, and um, we all hated it, obviously. Two out of three <laughs> falls for the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships. FTR beating the Briscoes, two falls to one. Uh, it was it was the best match so far this year. It was maybe the best match so far this decade. Um, it was absolutely incredible. I've only watched it once, so I don't feel qualified to talk about it yet because I'm going to watch it at least three more times this week. Um, what a match. What a match. Pump it in my veins. Just, just <laughs> fucking get it in my veins. It was so good. It was 44 <laughs> minutes that didn't stop. It went bang and didn't. You weren't bored. You weren't, you weren't distracted you weren't talking to your mates i was watching it with two good friends of mine that love wrestling as well we weren't we we were just focused on this match and every few seconds one of us would go whoa or hell's bell you know it was wow wow i can't gush about that match enough yeah i, I love the fact that that the briscoes worked a ftr match yeah. They're like, we're not going to do the whole plunder. We're not going to do the whole let, let's brawl. Every, like, they did a little bit of the brawling on the outside of that, but let's work a wrestling match. And that's what that needed for 44 minutes. It had to be that type of a match. And told a story. Uh, you know, you know me. I'm like, every week for my chicken salad for the last how long has just been FTR. There we go. That's it. <laughs> Carry on. FTR. One thing I, I noticed about it is, and and this is, it's going to sound really really corny, but it's an old school match. You know, it's like your 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 probably late eighties, early nineties match. It's it's probably the best fit, and FTR fit with everybody, but it's the best fit I've seen since the Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation way back when. And the reason is they adapt to each other so well, and they 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 clearly work it out so well backstage FDR are incredible they can do no wrong and they've been that way since the revival they've been that way since they were they were against DIY and American Alpha and they're, they're still they're getting better they're not they're not getting worse they're getting better yeah amazing I I would have loved to seen FTR against American Wolves oh god I, I would have yeah. like do you know what I mean like those guys I would have just the, the matches they could have had. I, I when Red Dragon come back, I want to see that. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? There's I so see... much. I mean what tag team don't you want to see him against though? That's the well, thing, is that you can you can put him up against Wingus and Dingus and they're gonna put on three and a half stars. I, Wingus yeah. and Dingus are one of my favorites. The US brothers. Yeah I <laughs> shouldn't I shouldn't discredit Wingus and Dingus. Well Dingus is Marty, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> In that team. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but Dingus is late late Cassidy, so it's not really a you know. I must admit, I did like in the the bit of the um because after after the, the match finished and they did a little speech in the ring, uh, Claudio and uh, your mate came out, Willie Yuta came out, and they did a face off in the ring. So to to say that 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 maybe Blackpool are going to go up against them in the the, the future of that. And then in the post-match scrum, it was just funny to see, like, the look on Tony Khan's face where Wheeler Yuta's like, like, I don't care, and this might make, get me a little bit of trouble, but FTR are the best tag team in the world today. And you could see Tony just going... How can you argue with that? They're the best. They're the best ones. You, you can't. You can't. The, the only team that in my opinion comes close to being as good as them and we will probably never see them match up are the Street Profits because the Street Profits are great, you know. Um, yeah. Yes, they wrestle the WWF style, but we will never see them them against each other, which is a shame because Street Profits are, are something. Oh, mind you, the Viking Raiders are great as well, but hopefully when one yeah. day. Yeah, when they're off hopefully. the leash, they're When really they're let good. loose, yeah. Yeah, hopefully one day we'll see that. 
But um, FTR, you know, and, and it seems like they've no desire to split. It seems like, like they're just happy being with each other. And yeah, yeah. I wonder if there's a chance that there is an indie version of FTR versus DIY. That is the one that, because for me, looking I mean, back, you Revival saw that. and DIY, you saw we, that we in saw NXT, it a lot. Really. But I, I, we saw it in the NXT style when they were still, they weren't quite what they are now. I think that the Revival were incredible, but I think FTR are clearly better than the Revival. Well, I think, I, I hope so. I hope. I mean, there's no word on where what Gargano is doing. He's being a dad is what he's doing and good for him. And good on him. Um, <clears throat> Champa is Mrs. Best Mate at the moment, and that is not a good role for Champa, it, to be honest, in my opinion. Uh, feel free to disagree, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, I don't think Tommaso Champa can last in that role as a long term prospect. So I think over time he will eventually, because if you look at everybody else that's been. Uh, Mrs. Best Mate, Damien Sandow, gone. Uh, mm. Alex Riley, gone. So, you know, how, yeah. how long? Well, it's also the fact, like, I was shocked that he even went to the, the main roster. I thought he was quite happy to be NXT. For, well, he probably was happy to be NXT. But then NXT wasn't NXT anymore. So I think that's yeah. what was sort of like, why, why yeah. would I stay here right now? I should try. Um, I, I really... I'm, I'm really excited about tag team wrestling because that match did nothing but make you excited for 44 minutes. It, it made yeah. you a fan again. It made you believe again. And anytime wrestling does that, it's outstanding. Mm. There, so there is, there, there's a team out there that I want to see. I, w- I would like them to, 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 they're not actually a team, but they, they teamed up once. I'd like to see him team more and see if they could do something together. And that is Brock Anderson and Brian Pillman Jr. Because they worked a match against FTR not too long ago in big time wrestling with Brett managing FTR and Arn managing, but they were called Sons of Horsemen. Oh, nice. And I, lo- I just love that idea. I love the idea of doing it. As much as I want to see Brian Pillman break out and be a singles guy, he's just not being used. I don't know what's going on and why, what they don't see in him. No. He's not being used to his capacity in the moment. He's almost being used as a job tag team guy, which is a for me it's is a massive yeah. It's a massive like oversight on there and there because when he was in MLW, everyone's like this kid has it and this kid's going to be the next like the next big baby face, the next big thing. And then he made the jump to AEW because why wouldn't you? Because the money was there. Yeah. And then they just don't seem to have done much with him. I'm hoping that next year's Owen Hart, this will be him. I'm just fingers crossed. I, yeah, I look for me, if, if he ends up being a tag team guy, that's fine by me because exactly what Jeff was just saying, tag team wrestling right now, it's impossible not to be excited by. Right. I want to make a couple more like specific comments about this match. Because yes. Jeff's saying it made you a fan again, right? The moment where there was a second where it for sure looked like the Briscoes were making it um, 2-0 and getting the win without FTR getting the win, getting the pin in. And I was completely sold. I was like, that's wild booking. I can't believe they did that. And then there was a kick out. Um, blew me away, you know. Uh, I thought that towards the end... I could tell that the end was coming up and I thought to myself, you know, the one thing that's disappointing to me is there's that FTR signature thing they do that I adore. And it's when they're both in a submission hold and they grab each other's hands. So they don't let each other tap out. And I thought to myself, it's a shame that they're about to finish that match, this match without doing it. And then they went ahead and did it. Um, (laughs) Yeah. It's, it just, it, it made me feel like a kid watching wrestling and falling in love. And if, 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 and 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 um, they're both excellent, but if Cash Wheeler isn't the most improved wrestler of probably the last ten years, I, I'd, I'd be shocked. He's so good right now. He's got he's just got the hot hand, I guess, is, is for want of a better term. 
Mm. I love it. Love and people it. talk up Dax because he does all the singles matches, but Cash just happy to, to to like support him at the moment. And then maybe sooner or later, Dax will be like, "Why don't you go and do some single stuff? So I'll back you up." Yeah. And for yeah. my money in that match, Cash received what I think was the greatest hot tag that I can remember ever, where Dax fell backwards into this hot tag and Cash came in and cleared house. Oh, yeah. absolutely spectacular. Made you believe that these guys were abs, that Dax especially was out on his feet, but used that last bit of energy and Cash came in house of fire. I- especially now after you've seen that match, like there was nothing that could have followed that. No. Like no. even if Claudio and Jonathan were on their best, like best game, they would not have been able to follow that match. And that crowd would have been completely exhausted because I think somebody pointed out to me, that was something I was watching. I was watching it. They were reviewing the show. That crowd were literally standing for the last 25 minutes of that match. And I know like, like commentators go, oh, the crowd are on their feet. And it's like, you know, you look at the crowd, everyone's sitting there. Everybody was standing watching that match. And for you to get how many a thousand people they had, and that's another thing I'll say too. Like, how good is it to see a Ring of Honor show where there are people back? Yeah, it's just good to see that. That that a lot of I can't remember if I've said this earlier in the show or not. ROW uh, ROH to me is what I wanted AEW to be. Absolutely, yep. I, that's I, what I, I think- wanted it to be. I think that it's very, very telling that I heard a chant during that match that I've never heard before, and it is tag team wrestling. And that made me smile so much because, you know, WWE, for better or worse, probably for the last decade outside of NXT, have not cared about tag team wrestling. And you can see that in the... and Yeah, Yeah, you can see that in the booking of... You can see that in the booking decision of, we'll just give it to the New Day for seven years and, and not worry about anybody else, which is a crying shame for the guys in the New Day as well as for the fans of tag team wrestling. AEW has brought tag team wrestling back, but this took it to a new level. This, like everything that FTR have done since January have taken tag team wrestling and really, really stamped it, which is fantastic. And then that's the thing, like I mentioned on the last show when I talked to you, to you Lachlan, that's why I wasn't a fan of Strickland... And Keith Lee getting those those AEW tag team belts because they're not a tag team. In my mind, they're not a, a dedicated yep. tag team. There's two single guys that they've put together and basically immediately gave a title to. When there are thousands of tag teams in that that company that are working as a tag team day in and day out, like if you'd have given that belt to like Silver and Reynolds, could have done something with it. Like they're not names that helps make them. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, Silver's I, over look, as well. I wanted those belts on Silver and Reynolds for years at this point. Yeah. yeah. Right. I I'm not arguing that it's that there's not other good teams to put the belts on. I like Swerve and um I was about to say Swerve and Strickland, but that's not right. <laughs> Swerve and Swerve and Lee. I think the Thank reason you. it was done is because Lee's got long COVID and he can't wrestle long matches yet. He's still finds himself exhausted. And I think that's the reason it was done because they want Keith Lee on television, so this is a compromise. And I think that uh, they're a fun team to watch. They, while, while I agree that they're two singles guys and I'm not always a fan of that, um, they've held up their end in almost every match they've been in. Actually, mm. get rid of the almost. They have. They've held up their end of the deal. Mm. So, you know. So, anyway, that... Like, uh, so much better than the first ROH showing. Like, they're finding their feet now. Like, I wouldn't mind if Tony gave the AEW creative to somebody else and he just worked on Ring of Honor, if that's what Ring of Honor was going to stay. If Ring of Honor stays like this, that's that's fine by me. That's This style is right up my alley. This is my AEW, if that makes sense. This is my alternative to the WWE. I find I AEW too much too much WWE ish at the moment. Whereas Ring yeah, of I, Honor is more of the wrestling I love. And this show, top to bottom, was great fun matches. You know, 
like we were talking earlier about how good Roosh versus Dragon Lee and the women's championship match was. And that's before we get to this absolute classic that closed out the show. <laughs> you could take out the defining match of this show and have a great show. Mm. I agree with you both completely. Uh, my wish is that they move Brian Danielson there because there's nothing more Ring of Honor than I'm going to kick his fucking head in. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and Danielson saying I have till five and things like that. Brian Danielson is still a Ring of Honor guy. So, Well, I mean, you know. I, I assume he would have been on the show already if he hadn't been injured. If he hadn't been injured. He would have already exactly. been on Ring of Honor in some way, shape or form. But in, agreed. In, in my mind... This pay per view was near perfect. It was not too long, and it was fun, and it held my interest through the whole run. Look, if I could have one wish for Ring of Honor, let's put Nigel McGuinness on commentary. That's, that's all <laughs> I want. Yeah. Like seriously, that's the size of change that I would have to make to make it a perfect show. Although Caprice did a great job, let's be honest. Caprice, Caprice was yeah. fantastic. Caprice. The one, like, it was one thing, and I only worked it out the other day what it was, and I couldn't because I could never get around. Um, Rick and Bonnie and Colt and I worked out it's because they sound the same yeah. yes these very similar voices very sim- because I think they're both, maybe both from Chicago very similar accents sometimes it was hard to tell which ones were which one was which whereas at least with Coleman and that you can tell you can tell which one's which and I thought the commentary was really really good on this show really really good yeah Agreed. um Look, do we want to talk chicken salad and chicken shit? Because I think all of our chicken salad is FTR versus the Briscoes, right? Yeah, I think you know what's... Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it can't be anything else. So I think that that's much of a muchness, right? It was the best match that was happening in the world. Yeah. Full stop. And, and yeah. my chicken shit is something that I talked to you guys off air about. The whole setup for this last Ric Flair match. That's, that's my chicken shit at the moment. Uh, uh, my chicken shit is that... Um, is that AEW booking is, is really frustrating me and it's really, like, it seems to be just in a holding pattern for, for months. Mm. Yeah, uh, my chicken shit is the fact that WWE uh, had a big moment to change what they were doing uh, with Brock Lesnar potentially walking out and it sounds like their first instinct was to grab Goldberg. Um, and I know Todd doesn't think it's real. It's, Todd doesn't no, think it's I, real. I don't think it was ever but, real. Um, I really don't think it was ever real. Sure, then in that case, my chicken sal- my chicken shit is the fact that I heard it and thought it would possibly be true, because that sucks. <laughs> there you go. Did I work around you there, Todd? You, you happy with that bit, one, mate? mate? I did. Um, <laughs> All righty. Jeff, you've got a big weekend this weekend wrestling-wise. What are you going to see? Uh, I'm going to go and see the Renegades of Wrestling show, um, Rebellion, or as I'm calling it, Rebels a Lion. Uh, hi, Ray. Um, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. It's headlined by Cracker Jack against Robbie Eagles for the first and possibly only time ever. Mm, yeah, that that. Mm, yeah, that. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's going to be something where it will be an interesting clash of styles. And I, Absolutely, I can't, I can't wait to see what they plan on doing. Well, I, I'm excited to come back and tell you guys all about it. Yes, for awesome. sure. Awesome. Well, we love having you on here, Jeff. Speaking of. Jeff, don't you do that WrestleBrainia thing? Do you want to plug that, mate? Yeah. um, Sydney listeners, we are coming to you. uh, Like us on Facebook, Twitter, follow us on Instagram for all of that kind of information. We'll be telling you more soon, including our guests. And and if you're going to PAX, uh, look out for us. We'll be at PAX as well. Oh, that's interesting. If we wanted to follow WrestleBrainia on Twitter, where would we do it, mate? Uh, At Wrestle underscore Brainia. Uh, we're there, and uh, Facebook WrestleBrainia and, and Instagram WrestleBrainia. Brilliant. Well, while we're going through tags, over on Instagram and Twitter, you can get at WrestleRadioAU. You can search Facebook for WrestleRadio Australia to find all of our stuff. As well as that, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Uh, it's free. You can do it anywhere. You can do it at YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, you can subscribe to us. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please do give us that five-star rating. It helps us get into a lot more ears. Another thing to mention, 
If you want to grab a hold of some merch, head on over to Redbubble, search for Wrestle Radio Australia. You can find some stuff there. And the proceeds don't go to the three of us. They go to Beyond Blue and Gotcha for Life, which are two amazing charities that do work for mental health, specifically men's mental health here in Australia. Uh, so with that, unless there's anything else you guys want to mention. Uh, no, I'm at Venom this weekend at the, what's it called? Lone Star Tavern and Mermaid Waters in the Gold Coast. If you want to come and see Mitch Ryder work, please do. Overload 6, I believe, is the name of that show. So you can check that out. That is the name indeed, sir. Big so. rumble to headline as well. Um, so that's exciting. So you can go check that one out. Um, anyway, for Jeff Setti and Todd Eastman, I've been Lachlan Albert. Have a good one.